Sir O'Brien here again, and this video is your part four of your topic seven evolution chapter that we have here. And in this section, we're going to be talking about uh, evidence that actually supports the theory of evolution. So again, evolution is considered a theory, which means it is backed up by multiple sources of information. And we're going to talk about all those different sources of information that prove that evolution is a viable theory. So the first evidence that we have is just simply that DNA is actually the universal genetic code. And what this simply means is that all <clears throat> organisms use DNA to store genetic information. They all use the same four bases, A, T, G, and C and they all use the same amino acids to form. So in other words, DNA, every organism uses DNA. Every organism converts that DNA into a strand of mRNA during a process called transcription. They use that mRNA then during a process called translation to make our polypeptide chain or our amino acids. So again, it's amazing to think about that every single organism on Earth uses the same universal genetic code. You know, a coincidence? I don't think so. Now, because of the genetic code, a lot of very different species have the same genes. So the more similarities that you have within these genes, the closer that they are related. So think about this in terms of you as a human. 98% of your genes are shared with chimps. So humans and chimps are more closely related, evolutionarily speaking, than you to a plant because we only share 18% of our genes with that. So the way that this works is the more genes that you share with an organism, the, the sooner that we have diverged into different species evolutionarily speaking, the closer that we are related. This is also why, if you think about it, why do we use chimps and primates to test medicines? Because they're so closely related to us that they most likely have the same effects. Now, <clears throat> another thing that we want to look at is the fossil record. So the fossil record shows uh, the record of ancient life forms and rock and shows how organisms have changed over time. So, in other words, if we look at it, if we find fossils in a, that are deeper than fossils that are higher, we know that the deeper ones came first. And we can see how those organisms have changed and evolved over the time. We can also use the fossil record to determine what type of animals came first. So, if you look here, shelled vertebrates came first, and then fish amphibians, reptiles, mammals, birds, and then the modern human. So where we find these fossils down in the, um, the different layers of the earth can actually tell us which organisms evolve first and which ones are newer life forms today. Now one example that we always look at, and it's a very good example, is actually the evolution of a horse. So if you look at it, horses used to be very small. And over millions upon millions of years, we're going this way, you see how they actually got bigger. But you'll notice that there are simil similarities between the modern recent horse and its ancestors. Okay, this peak of the nose. All right. Um, almost how the back of the skull is structured. Okay. Uh, opening of the jaw in that location, okay? So in other words, there are things that kind of connect the pieces of the puzzle going up, okay? And it shows how organisms changed, but how they share common characteristics in that fossil record. Now, another uh, piece of evidence that we have are things called homologous structures. And homologous structures, looking at similar anatomy of organisms to prove common ancestry. Now, one thing that's amazing, to me anyway, is that humans all have humeruses, which is the upper bone of our arm, okay? Located right there, okay? Cats have the same humerus. Whales have the same humerus. Bats have the same humerus. So in other words, all of these organisms share a common bro bone structure. Okay, another one would be like the radius, 
Radius would be this orange one right here. Okay, we'll do the radius and the ulna there. Okay, cats, there's their radius and ulna. Whales, radius and ulna. Bats, radius and ulna. So in other words, homologous structures are showing how all of these different organisms show very similar structures throughout time. Even though they're not closely related, at some point, they had a common ancestry because they are sharing the same. And even though these bones are evolved to have a different, um, different uh, function, they're all the same bone structure. Again, homologous structures. So another way you can look at this is if you look at all these different hearts, frog, turtle, mammal, bird, even though they're slightly different, they all have very similar patterns to them. They all have valves. Um, they all have arteries and veins coming in. So again, it shows that over time, evolutionarily speaking, we come from a common ancestor. Now, another piece of evidence that we want to look at are what are known as vestigial structures. And vestigial structures uh, are remains in some organism. They remain in some organisms and no longer serve any apparent function, but are links to other organisms to show common ancestry. Now, the one that I'm showing you here, this is a whale. Now, a whale doesn't have legs, so why does it have a hip bone? Or why does it have a pelvic bone? That pelvic bone has no apparent use whatsoever in the whale. But what it does show is that the whale has evolved from organisms that did have legs and did have hips in that structure. So again, vestigial structures are pretty much uh, evolutionary pieces of the past. Even humans have these vestigial structures. Okay, so for example, most of you guys get these out. Wisdom teeth. Okay, if you can get them out, why do we actually need them? So wisdom teeth are actually remnants of the past when we were consuming uh, a lot more non-processed food. So just things in nature. It was when our jaw lines were bigger and Neanderthals allowed us to break down more meat, break down more food. Okay, another one that we have is the appendix. So I'm sure some of you guys have gotten your appendix out kind of right here when it gets inflamed. So why do we have an appendix? So the appendix is actually uh, said to have produced enzymes that help aid in the break breaking down of cellulose. Now, obviously, since we are not as much of a plant eating type of individual anymore, we don't need that appendix as readily as we did before. Now, also, you may or might may or may not know this, but you all have tails or the remnants of tails. Okay, we call it the tailbone. So, at the base of your spine, you have a couple bones that actually protrude off the base of your spine. They don't come out in the form of a tail, but that is the remnants of tails of our evolutionary past in organisms that we were related. Again, these are three examples of vestigial structures that humans have in our body that really we don't need anymore. Now, another um, piece of evidence that we want to look at is something called embryology. Now, embryology in early stages of the development in many species with a backbone are very similar. So in other words, all or if not most organisms develop very similarly if they have a backbone or chordata as some people like to say it. So if you look at it here, you look at step one in the early stages right there, if you would just be given those pictures, you would almost say, well, they're all the same, okay? Well, early on, all organisms develop the same. And as we progress a little bit farther, and farther, then they start to diverge away. But even like with that, they still look very similar the closer related that we are. Okay, so even if we go before that, our fertilized egg right here, they all look pretty much the same. Okay, late cleavage or late development, when body segments form, still the same, limb body, still all close to the same, most of them, and then eventually we branch off into our specific sequence. So embryology speaking, all organisms develop very similar at the start, which shows that most likely we have a common ancestor. Now there are uh, a couple things that are found in most organisms. Gill slits, 
even humans have them. You can see them right there. Gill slits in birds, gill slits in reptiles, gill slits in fish. Uh, they all have tails. You see those there. Again, we're no similarly to it. Okay, the backbone, the chordata. So again, these similar features lead us to kind of believe that evolutionarily speaking, everybody shared a common ancestor when backbones were first developed. So again, another one, biological molecules, not just DNA, but proteins and amino acids in our bodies. So the more DNA and proteins an organism has in common, the more closely that they are related. So if you look at this here, notice that the chimp is more genetically related to humans than to an old world monkey. So again, kind of showing us where these branches are actually occurring. Same thing with uh, amino acids. If you look here, a chimpanzee has zero different amino acids than human, rhesus monkey, nine, rabbit, or excuse me, one for the rhesus monkey, nine for the rabbit, 10. So the more amino acids they share, the more closely that they are related to one another. Now, of all these different pieces of information, homologous structures, vestigial structures, universal genetic code, amino acid structure, um, embryology, each of these previous pieces of evidence show how organisms are related and where there was a common ancestry throughout evolutionary history. The more pieces of evidence in common, the closer that the individual are related. So if they share all of these, except for one little slight difference, they're most likely more closely related evolutionarily speaking than something that only shares uh, embryology or something like that. So hopefully this clears up evolution for you and gave you a bunch of good pieces of evidence for you to kind of look at.